Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be. My name is Sean and I'm delighted you're joining us for today's ESBC community webinar. Today I'm joined by Alexander Billington, who will cover Turn Your Rags to Riches using Azure a OpenAI. We love hearing what you guys have to say, so remember to join in on the conversation about today's webinar and more on X. Our handle is at ESBC underscore community and our hashtag is hashtag ESBC24. Tweet us, tag us, and tell us what you learned. Don't, let, don't forget to check out our Learning Hub, which is updated daily with the latest blogs, eBooks, webinars, and how-to videos. You can access and view the Learning Hub by visiting our website, sharepointeurope.com, and clicking the Content tab at the top. Don't let the learning stop here. Continue to keep up and stay ahead by joining us for our next Azure Week webinar, Exploring Azure Arc, Unleashing Extended Security Updates with Wim Mathieson, MVP. This webinar will take place Thursday, the 18th of July, 2024, at 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. CEST. For more information on this webinar, please check out www.sharepointeurope.com forward slash register for webinars. Join us for an exclusive opportunity at hashtag Fabcon Europe with our super early bird sale. Act now and secure your ticket before Friday, July 19th to unlock incredible savings of up to 700 euro. Don't delay, register today to reserve your place and take advantage of this limited time offer. Book your tickets today at www.sharepointeurope.com forward slash European Microsoft Fabric Community Conference. Early bird sale alert for hashtag ESPC24. Deep dive into the latest in governance, Azure, SharePoint, Copilot, Microsoft Teams, Viva Topics, API, AI, Microsoft Entra, Power Automate, Microsoft Purview, and more. Don't miss out. Register your interest today at www.sharepointeurope.com forward slash pricing. As always, if you have a question at any stage, feel free to type in the questions box and Alexander will get to it during the webinar. This webinar will be recorded and added to the resource center where you'll be notified by email when it is available. And now I'm going to pass you over to today's webinar presenter, Alexander. Hello, Alexander. Thanks for joining us today. Hi, uh, thank you for having me on. And as soon as I am able to share my screen, we can get cracking. Cool. Um, I don't think my screen is sharing yet. No, it's not yet. All right. Um, there we go. There we are. Awesome. Uh, cool. So uh, thank you for coming along today. And I'm going to be talking about uh, turning your rags to riches using generative AI and Microsoft Open Azure Open AI. Uh, so I will go a little bit over who I am, what I'm going to talk about, and then I will jump into it. Uh, so I'm Alex. Um, I am the lead R&D engineer for a company called Hurry, uh, who make uh, analytics dashboards uh, using a whole post, whole host of different connectors, and powering the entire thing using AI and generative AI. Uh, and I sort of work looking at how we can apply generative AI to a number of different use cases. Um, I've been a machine learning engineer for uh, a little over six years now. Um, I've worked across a number of different industries from sort of uh, sports wearables to agri-tech through to sort of insurance um, and seen kind of the fact that although they're very different industries, the challenges that are faced are very similar um, in all of the different cases. And a lot of the problems are around taking an idea figuring out what you can actually do with AI and then taking it all the way through to production. Um, and as for generative AI, I've been working on industry products for about a year, uh, which doesn't seem like very long, but it wasn't all that long ago that kind of generative AI and chat GPT first came out. So I feel like I've had about as much experience as you can get working on it. So hopefully I will be able to share something uh, a little bit useful and to get you kickstarted in using generative AI in your sort of projects and businesses. Uh, so more specifically, what we're going to talk about today 
Uh, I'm going to very quickly go over a short history of artificial intelligence, uh, just to sort of set the scene, look at the different sort of technologies, how long it's been around, and then where sort of generative AI fits into the picture. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit sort of at a high level what generative AI and large language models are, what they can do, how they work, but also what they can't do. Uh, and then after that, I'm going to jump into RAG. I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you how it works. I'll go over some of the core concepts. Uh, and then I will sort of talk about how you can actually build a RAG implementation really easily. Um, and if time permits, I'll do a small demo uh, looking at Azure OpenAI and AI Studio, Azure AI Search, and then also a little bit of Python and LangChange to sort of tie it all together um, and build a nice sort of application that can be productionizable and bring um, generative AI in hopefully an hour uh, to a meaningful use case. So jumping into a quick history of artificial intelligence, the dates on this are a little bit rough. It's kind of hard to pin it all down exactly, um, but just to sort of give an idea of the timescales. AI as a field uh, sort of came about in the 1950s and it was very different to what we see today. It was more just around computer-based problem solving and seeing if you can create a computer or a machine or a program that has similar to human intelligence and is able to solve problems. Uh, so there are a number of sort of different early examples. Um, one of the one of the best, in my opinion, and my favorite is Shaky the Robot, who was essentially a pathfinding autonomous robot. And you've got the name Shaky because the technology at the time meant that every sort of second, a few times a second, he was recalculating his path, coming up with slightly different routes each time and would end up just sort of wobbling all over the shop, trying to travel from one point to another. Um, that sort of developed and advanced. And in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s, we got what is now referred to as kind of traditional machine learning. Uh, which are sort of your just traditional algorithms, things like your linear and logistic regression, support vector machines, random forests, things like that. And that was where machine learning sort of came into artificial intelligence. It didn't take over the field, it became sort of a subset of the field and is looking at using existing data to make predictions or classifications for unseen data by sort of training a model so that when it gets new and unseen data, it can make these predictions. And then sort of 2010s towards 2020 is when deep learning really took up and became a lot more accessible. Uh, so deep learning, again, just how machine learning is a subset of artificial intelligence. Deep learning is essentially a subset of machine learning algorithms that focus on deep neural networks um, in order to make those predictions, but using a bigger model and hopefully provide better results. And so they are things like feed forward neural networks, CNNs, convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, and things like that. Uh, so with the advent of technologies like TensorFlow becoming readily available, PyTorch um, and sort of cloud compute and GPUs getting more powerful and cheaper, we were able to get more powerful algorithms to do better predictions. Uh, and the generative AI is a sort of subset of deep learning in itself. Uh, so I'll go over a few of the sort of key definitions uh, and terminologies around generative AI um, before jumping into some of the sort of use cases and how to actually use it. Uh, so generative AI is essentially a subfield of artificial intelligence, which is around creating new information and content, whether that be text-based content, image-based content, videos and audio. It is taking previously found data, training a model, and then creating something new. So it's not saying, oh, I've got this time series pattern. I want to predict the next three days. It is more, you know, I can generate new text and information um, and all of the things that go along with that. Uh, within generative AI, the models that are most frequently used are foundation models. So foundation models or pre-trained models, as they're referred to, are huge machine learning models that have been pre-trained on fast data sets. Um, and so they are able to be very sort of generalized, trained on a large amount of data, and then sort of fine-tuned or used for more specific tasks. And then the sort of focus of the, the talk I'm going to do today is going to be on large language models which are a type of foundation model specifically around natural language processing. Uh, so there's are things like your GPT models, your Llama models, everything like that. And they will take text as an input and produce text as an output, but are able to do various different tasks um, on that information. Um, so a lot of the use cases of large language models um, are based on the data that you have available and the sort of outputs that you want. So if we go over the sort of right to left of the diagram, uh, of what sort of things you can achieve with it and then what sort of data you would need. So large language models are perfect for things like question answering, sentiment analysis, information extraction, or text summarization. So I'm sure a lot of you have used ChatGPT or Gemini or similar tools and gone, 
oh, I really need to rephrase this email, that doesn't sound quite right, or essentially using it as a new search engine to get information. That is something that large language models are fantastic at doing because they can take your text and then transform it into something more, something better, something summarized, um, and the sort of information that you can feed in is essentially anything that comes in a text-based form. Uh, but for a lot of use cases, you might be looking to sort of summarize some meeting notes, summarize technical or legal documents that are very difficult. Uh, you might want to do some sentiment analysis on call transcripts in your call center just to see, you know, are people generally happy with the service or people not? Uh, you can also create very powerful sort of question and answer chatbots or knowledge based intelligence layers. So you can feed in lots of, sort of previously asked questions and answers. So rather than having to do a sort of, oh, this is the question, this is the most similar, let's provide an answer. You can actually give it an entire knowledge base and leverage AI in order to provide sort of new more specific answers rather than keeping things very generic uh, and you can also use sort of any other data that you can think of that is text-based that might be useful in your business um, so we're going, we're going to go through a slightly silly example but we're going to take it from beginning to end of how we can use a large language model we'll highlight what the limitations of it are and then we will implement the solution to the challenge and the problem that i pose so the question we're going to answer today is who is robert goodman uh, so I'm fairly certain that is going to be a question no one is going to have the answer to uh, because Robert Goodman is a character that I made up for a tabletop role playing game that I play with my friends. Uh, he exists within my Google Drive and nowhere else on the Internet. So if we were to ask ChatGPT who he was, um, it could do its best at giving an answer. Uh, at first it says it doesn't know. I provide it a little bit more context and then it has a shot at answering the question. But unfortunately, ChatGPT in this case is wrong. That is not who Robert Goodman is. And this kind of leads to one of the biggest problems in generative AI at the moment, which is hallucination, uh, which is where large language models don't know what they don't know. And you can ask them a question and they can give you an incredibly confident answer, um, which you know sounds plausible, it sounds real, but it is complete nonsense. It might not even be relevant to what you asked, but they're gonna say it in such a way that it's presented as a fact. Um, so that kind of, in itself presents a lot of challenges, but also if you're trying to build a tool to answer very technical questions or to answer questions on sort of information within your business that isn't publicly available or in those foundation models, you're not gonna be able to do it. Uh, so you will potentially need to look at using other techniques and other methods to be able to leverage the power of large language models and generative AI, but actually have it suited to your use case um, and able to do what you need, which is in this case, answer a question on a man called Robert Goodman. Um, so there is one way, well, there's two main ways that you can add context to large language models. Uh, one is fine tuning and one is RAG. Uh, fine tuning, I will cover very quickly now, which is essentially uh, you take the foundation model, you take all of your data and then you retrain that model. So all of that information is baked into the foundation model's understanding. Uh, that is a fantastic thing to do if you have huge amounts of data, huge amounts of time and huge amounts of money. Uh, but fine tuning can be incredibly expensive and computationally complex. Um, and so it is kind of like a last resort. Uh, so what we're going to look at is using RAG, which is retrieval augmented generation, which is essentially a way of feeding in context that a model otherwise wouldn't have to it. So when you're asking it questions, uh, you are able to actually give answers on context and information outside of the foundation model's knowledge base. Um, and that is broken down essentially into three main steps. So the first step in RAG is retrieval. So you have someone ask a question, in this case it's who is Robert Goodman, and we need to go and retrieve information from somewhere that might contain the answer. Um, so that is oftentimes a vector database, uh, which we will cover soon. Uh, we're then able to search that vector database, find text information, documents, things from sort of the private data source that we have or from within our business that might be able to answer the question. We can then combine that information that we've retrieved with the initial question uh, to create an augmented sort of prompt. And then we're able to generate an answer, taking that new information, taking the original question and leaning on that large language model to actually answer our question, which otherwise would be unanswered um, by the model, which is pretty fantastic. And it has a ton of use cases. Um, you know, one of the big ones that you can find is if you're looking at creating a question and answer knowledge base, you might have a product which has huge amounts of technical documentation and huge amounts of sort of stuff that you could do with it and you want to build a chatbot but you can't just go you know what we'll get to ask chat we'll use that api 
uh, because it's not going to know. But what you can do is you can embed all of that sort of technical documentation, documentation, the inside knowledge that you have, all of the sort of knowledge that you're leaning on into a vector database, create that rank implementation. And now you have somewhere and a chatbot which can answer questions specifically on your product, on your business. Uh, in this case, for my friends who I play games with online, um, which can be incredibly useful and really sort of push generative AI to sort of the next level. Uh, so we're now going to get into a little bit more of the technical side of how this works and what this will look like. Uh, so this is a sort of very basic architecture diagram of what a RAG implementation might look like, um, some of the sort of technologies and things that are involved, and then the general flow um, of the process. So I'm not sure if my mouse can be seen on the screen, uh, but we're starting in the top left with the user who has got a question, which is, tell me about Robert Goodman. Uh, so the first thing that our program is going to do is it is going to embed that question, uh, which is essentially just turning the text into numerical embeddings, vector embeddings, so that we can pass it into a semantic search where we are going to search a vector knowledge base, a vector database uh, for relevant documents to that question. Um, just before we've done this, or sort of along the side, we take all of the documentation that we want to use, and we want to provide as context to the model, and we also embed that into vector stores and we store that in the database so we can essentially take a question take all of the information that might contain the answer and search through it very quickly and with a high accuracy to find the documents that can answer that question for us uh, once we have done that search uh, we do some prompt injection where essentially we just add the uh, question and the context together into a big block of text and then we pass all of that into the llm and say given this information please provide me with an answer and then our model is now able to create an answer to that question, uh, which we can use. So there are a few sort of core components in here, uh, which I will sort of try and explain and then demo. So the first one is a large language model. Uh, a lot of people are very familiar with them. This is just one of those pre-trained foundation models. Uh, there are a huge number of providers who are creating them at the moment. Uh, some of the sort of most common ones are the GPT models from, um, OpenAI, there's your Llama models from Meta, and then you have things like your Falcon models and various other people who are trying to build these state-of-the-art models. And essentially all they are are these big pre-trained models trained on a massive data set, far bigger than we would be able to get our hands on so that we can have a huge amount of knowledge and also the ability to sort of restructure information, have that sort of conversational tone and leverage all of the information and all of the computing power that they have. Uh, the next thing that we need is a vector database. Uh, which is essentially a specialized type of database often used within machine learning uh, for storing data as high dimensional vectors, which are essentially mathematical representations of the features, the attributes, the semantics of the information that you have. Uh, and there's a number of them out there. Microsoft offer one called AI Search, uh, which was previously known as Cognitive Search. And then there are providers such as ChromaDB, Pinecone, various other ones on the market. And they all sort of have their different advantages, um, different strengths, but I won't go over what they are too much because I could probably spend an hour talking about all of the different vector databases, which would probably be a little bit dull. And then finally, it's not necessarily a core component, uh, but it definitely needs to be spoken about when talking about uh, generative AI, which is prompt engineering. Prompt engineering is less of a component, more of a sort of tool or a technique, uh, and it's essentially the way you get the information that you want from large language models and generative AI. It is how you provide the instructions to the model and how you get it to give you the information that you want in the format that you want and also do a few things around sort of preventing unwanted answers, dealing with edge cases, all sorts of things like that. And there's a few different techniques that come with prompt engineering. Uh, this kind of zero shot prompt engineering, which is where you essentially give a prompt, give a question and let the model go wild. There's few shot, which is sort of a back and forth. You give a few examples and you ask a question and get an answer. And then there's a few sort of templates and frameworks around there, things like CoStar and meta prompting, which is just sort of slightly more, rough, slightly more robust techniques to get the information that you want from these large language models. Um, so first, what is the basics of a large language model? I've kind of gone over it very roughly, but I've tried to sort of simplify it and put it in a little bit more of an explained view here. So you take a natural language input, uh, where we start on the left, which is essentially just a piece of text um, as it is worded. Uh, you then essentially will need to, I say you will need to, uh, it's often covered by the various different libraries in the models that you're using, but it will tokenize 
the information, which is essentially where it splits down a large block of text into tokens, which are a slightly smaller form of the language, which are more digestible by the models and by the programs. And what they are are essentially words or subwords from the text. Sometimes they can be a little bit longer than that. They can be phrases. But a good way to think of a token is essentially just a word. Uh, so you break all of this down into tokens. Uh, you can then pass your tokenized response into the model. Uh, the model then has a prompt, um, which is going to be, in this case, you are an AI helper designed to summarize text. Please summarize and shorten any inputs you receive. So that is the sort of the purpose or the goal for this particular application of the large language model. So we're passing in our longer form piece of text. We're tokenizing it. And then the model is going, right, my job is to shorten this and make this easy to digest. So that prompt combined with model, combined with what the user has provided, allows us to get the natural language output, which in this case is a summarization of the description of what tokens are. Um, so that is definitely a very oversimplified view of how large language models work, but it kind of gives you the black box view of this is what goes in, this is what comes out, this is how we kind of interact with it and control it. Uh, so the next component we want to look at are vector databases. Again, this is going to be a very oversimplified view of what a vector database is. I'm not going to cover things um, like the algorithms that they use to vectorize stuff. I'm just kind of going to talk about their purpose. So the first thing a vector database does is that it stores embeddings and they are uh, numerical representations of the semantic input of data, which is a little bit of a mouthful, but it's essentially turning words into big lists of numbers, uh, which can be numerically represented. Um, and it allows for a much better way to store information. So you're not just limited to trying to find similar words. You're able to store kind of the semantics of the words and a huge amount of information, uh, which can be looked up very quickly. Um, oftentimes when you are taking your data and putting it into a vector database, you will use a specifically trained model for embeddings, uh, which essentially will take your information. It will embed it. Um, and to turn it into these vectors, which can then be stored in the database. So that's kind of an extra step that's not really included um, in the general concept because they're kind of a third party. But it's important to note that you will need something that will take this information, turn it into a vector for it to be stored in the database. But where the real power, especially with RAG and the vector database comes in, is the ability to do very fast, very accurate searches across huge volumes of data. Um, and so they are very good at doing similarity searches and finding data, uh, which is a very close or almost perfect match without literally saying, OK, I have the phrase, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog. I am trying to pull out exactly that phrase. It will be able to pull out information that is similar based on the semantics of that, but not necessarily exact, which is excellent when you're looking for a RAG implementation, because you might be asking the question, who is Robert Goodman? And I could have, you know, a thousand documents talking about various different characters. And it will recognize, you know, I don't have a document called who is Robert Goodman. That text doesn't exist. However, this document mentions this man a lot. And so it is the most similar. And so we are going to return that one to be used in the RAG to answer the question. Um, that is what vector databases do. Uh, it's also worth noting that this isn't a diagram that I made. Uh, I spent about half an hour trying to make a nice diagram and couldn't do it. This is um, a brilliant diagram from a blog by Quadrant, who are another vendor for vector databases. And they have a huge amount of information on vector databases, how they work and how to use them. If you're interested in looking at some more stuff to read around this topic. And then finally, we get to prompt engineering, um, which is essentially the tool you use to get the good responses out of your models. And quite often we find that the better the prompt, the better the response. So taking a little bit of time and having an understanding of prompt engineering is extremely useful when it comes to building a um, large language model application and getting good responses from it. Uh, much like with sort of traditional machine learning, the quality of the data that goes into the model dictates the quality of the output uh, in large language models and in generative AI, the quality of the prompt is definitely the biggest determining factor in how well your model will perform. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of different things that you could do with prompt engineering. I'm just gonna cover one framework that I personally like to use and find works very well. Uh, there is no sort of one size fits all solution to getting the optimal prompt. Uh, but there are certainly a number of steps that you can take on board and follow in order to help. So I'm going to go over the CoStar prompt, uh, which is another giant acronym uh, in the AI field, which is just a world of giant acronyms. And this stands for context, objective, style, tone, audience and response. Uh, so it is sort of a set of guidelines or rules, maybe even a checklist when you're building your prompt 
to ensure that you have everything you need to give the model the best chance of providing you an answer with the information you want in the format you want. And so essentially you can literally break down your prompt into a subtitle context and then explain the context that you want and then objective and then explain it like that. Or you can just sort of have a long paragraph and go over it and make sure that you tick off all of these boxes. And either way, you're going to end up with a really good, really powerful prompt. Uh, but just to give a little bit of information on what these mean, context is essentially just setting the scene for what your bot is trying to do. Uh, in this case, I would give the context of the uh, Robert Goodman helper bot. You are a helpful assistant designed to provide information on fantasy characters. Uh, so that kind of sets a little bit of the information about what it's expected to do. Uh, you would then tell it what its objective is, and it would be your objective is to provide a concise answer, um, bringing to light information on the topic requested. Or if you were a sort of something different, you want a QA tool, you were potentially trying to summarize or uh, do sentiment analysis, you might have an objective like your objective is to uh, state the sentiment of tweets uh, that you receive, anything like that. The style is a little bit more around how you want it to start um phrasing things you know you could have the style of you only ever speak in rhyme or you are very formal and you are um to reply in full sentences with proper grammar it just gives you a little bit of an opportunity to shape how you want the model to respond uh, based on the sort of needs of your application uh, you then have the tone which is again quite similar to style it's essentially i want this to be deadly serious i want this to be light-hearted and jovial it's just sort of more fleshing out how you want the bot to interact uh, because the sort of better the tone and the style of your use case, the more likely people are to get on with the, the tool that you're building. Because in a lot of cases, people will go online and say, oh, we'll have to use a chatbot. I really can't be bothered with that. That's rubbish. It's not going to do what I want. But if you set the tone right, you know, you can trick people into thinking it's actually a human, probably a little bit far fetched, but at least have it be an engaging tool that people are at least able to tolerate engaging with. Uh, you then want to kind of set a little bit of a scene for the audience of the responses and the people who are going to be asking the questions so whether that be you know you're building a tool as a very technical individual but it's going to be for very high level sort of boardroom execs or is it going to be for people with no information at all is it going to be for people who are a little bit older you can kind of specify who the audience are to give it even more of a hand at creating those outputs that you want and then finally you can just tell it the format that you're looking for uh you know you can write in a couple of questions and the answers that you want and say, I need you to provide this format of response. You can ask it to provide sources. So if you are using a RAG implementation, you can get it to cite which document this information came from. So if you're you know, looking to be able to go back and fact check yourself or your tool or whether it's a sort of internal bot and people go, you know what, that was a great answer to the question. I need a little bit more information. You can tell them what internal document that answer came from and they are able to go and look up a little bit more information. Uh, which kind of gives you a two-in-one for a tool. Not only is it able to answer questions, it's essentially uh, an automated sort of indexing and document storage tool all in one go. So if you have like a blob store or a Google Drive folder, you can put all of your documents in there, uh, embed them into an index database, and then it will tell you the names of people who just go search for a specific document to get the information they want, uh, which just makes life a lot easier and saves a lot of time for people. Uh, so they are in a little bit of a hurry, sort of the core components of large language models and RAG um, at lightning pace. So now what we're going to look to do is actually get a little bit more into the technical side of it and learn how can I actually make this implementation? How can I put all of these sort of theories and components into practice and build a chatbot, a large language model application, uh, and not have to spend months and years kind of doing all of the development? There's fortunately a so huge suite of tools that we can leverage to make this a very fast and easy process. So the first thing that we need is a large language model. And here we're going to use Azure OpenAI, uh, which is essentially a very easy to use tool that provides um, API access to these large language models. Uh, there's a huge number of Python libraries that support them. So essentially all you need to do is spin up this model, create a deployment for it, and then you have API access to it. One of the advantages of using Azure OpenAI when you're creating these deployments is it keeps your data safe and kind of entirely within your Azure tenant. So you're not firing your sort of very sensitive questions off into the ether. They're not then being kind of assimilated and retrained into further iterations of the models. They are private, they're secure, they exist only within your Azure tenant. So yes, you're able to ask the model this, but that data isn't being stored anywhere that you don't know about. 
uh, and it's also kind of a cheap, cost-effective and easy way to do this. Uh, the next thing that we need is a vector database, and we're going to use Azure AI Search uh, because it becomes quite easy to keep all of these things within the Microsoft tenant. It's easy to demo. There's a lot of easy interconnectivity between them, and we can also leverage things like the Azure AI Studio, uh, which is a sort of low-code tool for building AI applications and um, sort of playgrounding and messing around with some of the technology. And then finally, we need a framework to do all of these components of the RAG to do the semantic search, to query the model, to handle our prompts and to create a response. Uh, so we're going to use Langchain for that. Langchain is essentially a huge open source framework for building these sorts of complex large language model applications. Um, they have a huge number of sort of connectors and integrations with a number of different models, a number of different vector databases. They provide their own sorts of tools for creating prompts. Uh, they have something called the LCEL, uh, which is essentially a lang chain sort of format for building chains and these complex applications. Uh, so we will go over all of that in just a second. Uh, and the final thing that you can see hiding up in the corner is Streamlit. Um, it's nice building these applications. Um, as a software developer, you know, you can get away with a lot just building stuff in a terminal using inputs and outputs. But if you want to hand this over to testing or make it look a little bit prettier, Streamlit is a fantastic way to essentially put a web front end on Python code without having to have any web development experience at all. Uh, I am a terrible web developer. I can't really write JavaScript to save my life and HTML and CSS confuse me a bit, but I am going to be able to put a nice sort of pretty web front end on this chatbot using Streamlit and Python. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to jump into a demo. I'm going to attempt to do it in real time. It was working when I tested it about 20 minutes before going live. Uh, so hopefully it's still working now. Uh, but what I'm going to cover in this demo is essentially how we embed data and create an index in AI search. I'm going to do that using AI Studio. This is how you essentially take your documents and your information, uh, you embed them, you index them, and you store them in a vector database. Uh, we're then going to go over how to create a RAG implementation using Langchain. We're going to talk about connecting all of the relevant services. We're going to create a prompt, do a little bit of prompt engineering, and then finally, we are going to be able to get the answer to the question, who is Robert Goodman? Um, so hopefully I should be able to swap. I believe now you should all be able to see uh, the little web front end and my uh, Google Chrome. Yeah, um, I can see that. Cool, that's perfect. So we're going to start by jumping in to Azure's AI Studio. Um, might just zoom it in a tiny bit. Oh, that's too much. Um, so AI Studio is essentially a software tool uh, that Microsoft provides to manage all things generative AI. Um, and it is a fantastic place to manage a huge amount of the overheads of your uh, generative AI project. Uh, so I've created one currently with the very inventive name of Alex Demo. Uh, so there are a couple of things in here that are going to be particularly interesting to us. Uh, so if we scroll down to the bottom, the first one is going to be a tab called Deployments. Uh, so this is essentially a layer that interacts directly with um, Azure OpenAI. And this is where we can actually deploy those large language models. Uh, so I've got a few here. I have a GPT 3.5 Turbo 16K deployment. I have a GPT 4.0 deployment. And I also have a text embeddings deployment. Uh, these are sort of large language models through Azure OpenAI which give us that API access to those models. They aren't things that we have to train or interact with. Uh, we can quite simply hit the deploy model button. Uh, Microsoft gives you access to a huge number of models. Uh, so we can hit the search bar there. We can see that there's a number of different GPT models that we can use. You can select them and essentially you can deploy them in just a few clicks. Um, and then that gives you everything you need there. Uh, the next thing that AI Studio provides for us is a fantastic way to actually store and interact with your data and create those embeddings. Uh, so what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to embed our data um, into a vector data index or a vector database index. So the first thing that we need is the actual data. Um, so I will, in fact, show an example of what we would do. So quite simply, we want some more data. We want to store it somewhere so that it can be used and create these indexes. Uh, so there are a number of ways you can do this. You can connect directly through to various different blob stores. Uh, you can get data from a URL uh, with storage, or we can upload the files. Uh, so quite simply what that looks like is that. We can find the file that we want to do. 
we can see that there is a document there with all our lovely information about Robert Goodman, uh, which we can open and upload. Um, then essentially you can give it a name and you can store it there. Uh, just to save time and to hope that things don't crash, I've done this already, but that would be how you do that. Uh, you're then also able to see all of your indexes which are kind of associated with your particular project. And it is incredibly easy to create a new index. You don't have to, you know, do any sort of coding or write any sort of scripts and processes. Uh, there's definitely the option to do that, uh, which in sort of larger applications where you're constantly getting new documents and refreshing them, you can do. But that is something that can be done using Langchain and potentially something like an Azure function. Uh, but just for the case of getting something off the ground, uh, the first thing you'll want to do is you will want to select a data source that you wish to embed. Uh, in this instance, we have some data which we've already uploaded to the AI Studio. Uh, so we can select there that we have our RAG data, which is all of that good information about Mr. Robert Goodman. Uh, you can then essentially select um, an Azure OpenAI service, which contains an embeddings model. Uh, and as we saw when we looked at the deployments, um, I currently have an ADA2 text embeddings model available. So I can collect, select my AI, um, oh, this isn't the model, this is a different one. I'm getting ahead of myself. This is actually the, um, the search service that we wish to use, not the OpenAI service. Uh, many apologies. This is essentially, we're saying, where do we want to store the data? Um, so this is saying, right, this is my Azure AI search service that I want to store my index in. I can give it a name, um, index two, uh, and then you know you have the option to select the compute you wish to use for the um, for the indexing process. Uh, you have an option of essentially you do it completely serverlessly, uh, so you can do it with beefier compute if you've got more data. If you're trying to save cost, you can use cheaper compute. As I'm not going to run this, I'm just going to get it to auto select. This is the point. Um, where we want to add in the vector search and we want to add in our OpenAI connection. Uh, so we select the Azure OpenAI um, that we want to use. And then if there is a text embeddings model, it will pick it by default. And if there isn't, it will just create one for you and do it there, which is incredibly useful. Um, we also want to make sure that we select adding vector search uh, to the search resource so that we can actually do these vector searches. Uh, and then finally, you can review everything here and it will show you what you're going to call your index, where you're going to store it, if you're going to do the vector stuff and which um, AI service you're going to use to do that. I'm not going to click create because that will take about 15 minutes uh, and I've done one already sort of blue pieces style. So we can see here that we have my index already made. So that is essentially all of the setup that you need to do to be in a position where you can create a um, RAG implementation, a QA chatbot using your data. Um, there is the option to use Promptflow um, and the sort of inbuilt playground in AI Studio, which is a sort of a very, again, a very lightweight, um, low code solution for building these sorts of tools. But we're looking to do something that's a little bit more robust, uh, a little bit more sort of production ready. So we are going to jump over into Visual Studio Code. Um, so that is about as zoomed in as I can get. So it's going to be a tiny bit dull. I'm going to do one of the big presenting faux pas, and I'm essentially just going to talk through code. Uh, but you don't need to worry. This is a very short script. I'm not going to go into sort of line by line detail on everything. I'm just going to go over a few of the key points so that you get the idea of the flow of the code, and then we can jump into actually seeing it in practice. Um, so the first thing that we need to do is import all of the libraries that we're going to use uh, in this large block here. So you can essentially see that it is mainly Langchain and not much else. Langchain is able to cover a huge amount of the heavy lifting for us. It can deal with the um, vector database, it can deal with the model, it can deal with the embeddings, it can deal with the inputs and the outputs. Essentially, we're leaning very heavily on Langchain to do all of this. There are just a couple of other sort of utility libraries and then Streamlit itself um, that we need. The next thing that we want to do is essentially set a few environment variables. Um, Streamlit is very clever and it provides its own secret management. So you don't necessarily have to worry about having .m files, setting the environment variables yourself. You can add all of your keys and all of your names into a, um, a file called secrets.toml, which I'm not going to show you because it contains all of my secrets. Um, but essentially that is just the um, environment variable name and its value. And then you can call them from the streamlit.secrets here. 
So we're setting a couple of environment variables for the OpenAI key and the OpenAI endpoint, because the way that these line chain connectors work, they need to read from the environment rather than having those variables passed in. Uh, there is then a little bit of streamlit code just to make things look pretty. Uh, so we are getting uh, a logo from a local file and we are sort of setting the page title and the page icon that we will see in the browser. Uh, and then the next thing we need to do is we need to set up a few um, variables that are going to remain within the state of our Streamlit session uh, without getting too much into sort of how Streamlit works. Essentially, it just runs a Python script um, and then you use the various Streamlit components to build web applications. But essentially, it is constantly rerunning this script every single time you interact with the application. Uh, so you don't necessarily need every time you press a button or enter the text input to it to run all of your code, recreate your connections. And so it is able to facilitate things called session state variables, uh, which is essentially a variable that persists through multiple runnings of the code using the cookies in your browser. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to store our conversation history in the session state. Uh, so if we run the page and the script reruns, we don't lose all of the messages that we've had previously. And then we want to load all of the models that we are going to need. Uh, so we're going to need the um, GPT-40 model, uh, which we're going to use the Azure Chat OpenAI um, Langchain module to do. All we need to do there is pass in the API version and the deployment name. Uh, and that is going to create a model object that we can use to invoke, call the API, and use the large language model. Uh, we need an embeddings model, which we're going to use to take the questions, embed them, and then perform a vector search. Again, that just needs the deployment name and the API version. And then finally, we have the AI search object, and that is going to be how we interact with our index that we created in the AI studio. Uh, that requires the endpoint, the secret key, the name of the index, and then um, an actual embeddings model. Um, so this is going to use the ADA2 text embeddings model that we created previously to embed that question so that we can do those vector lookups. Uh, and then once all of that is done, we can move on to a couple of little helper functions. Uh, one is a vector search function, uh, which just sort of nicely wraps up the entire process of doing a vector search. It is extremely easy using Langchain. Uh, you can see here that essentially we do it in a single function. Uh, and it's essentially one line of code. We take in a prompt, which is a string, quite simply the question, uh, as the input. And then we create the documents by um, using our vector store object, calling the similarity search function, passing in the query, the sort of number of responses that we want to look up, and then the search type that we used to wish to use. And it is as simple as that. That one function call will take the input and it will search and it will return the documents that we are looking for. Uh, I do a little bit of just sort of post-processing to compile it all into a single uh, long document. So it's going to return up to two most similar documents. I just want that to be one giant block of text to be handled by the model when we're creating the prompt. So I create a list and then merge the list together. There's probably better ways of doing that. It's not the most elegant, but it gets the job done. Uh, and then the final thing, and probably the biggest part of this, is actually creating our chain and um, getting our system prompt, our input, and our sort of context and compiling it all together. Uh, so it's worth noting that you can do all of this in one fell swoop in Langchain. We could create a chain that includes a lookup to a vector database, but to keep it simple and to sort of highlight the one, two, three process of retrieval, augmentation, and generation, augmentation and generation. I've broken it down. Uh, so what we're taking in the call model function is the string of the user's input. So this is again just the question they asked, and we're also taking the data that we retrieved from the um, the data that we retrieved from the vector database, and then we are creating our base prompt. And so using Langchain, this is incredibly easy to digest and understand. Um, so essentially, we are using a chat prompt template, which again is a Langchain object. Um, and we're creating it from the template here. So you can see that we have a long, a long string. It's actually quite a short string, a small string with our prompt, which it says, you are a helpful assistant designed to answer questions. Um, we could probably do with a little bit more information there if this was a bit more robust, uh, but that covers you know, quite a number of the sections of our CoStar prompt framework. 
describing what we wanted to do, how we wanted to interact. And then essentially we are saying, please answer the following question. We're then able to reference the question that is being passed in from the user and say, use the information provided and we can specify the information there. So if you're wanting to inject lots of different pieces of context into your prompt, Langchain and the LTEL is a fantastic way to do it because it allows you to have multiple essentially variables that you can refer to without having to, you know, create a huge string. So I don't have to join all of these strings together to create one absolute mammoth thing that's hard to understand. I can use all of these different variables that I'm mentioning. And then when I'm creating the chain, I can pass all of those in. Uh, so the final thing that we want to do is we want to uh, create a string output parser, which is essentially just a nice little tool that will format things better for us. Uh, there's nothing particularly important or complex going on there. And then finally, we create the chain. Uh, the chain is essentially the process of steps um, that we are going to use. Which is that bit there. So what we have first is our prompt. We need to provide a system prompt and need some instructions of what to do. And also because this is RAG, we want to have the question and the context involved in it. Uh, we then pass in the model that we wish the um, chain to use and then we pass in some information about the output output and then when we want to call this thing we can quite simply do chain.invoke and then we can pass in those parameters that we specified in our prompt so you can see that we have question there which is the user prompt which joins up to that information there and then we have information which is the retrieved data from the vex database which corresponds with that so tying this all together now we have uh, essentially the main flow of the Streamlit app. Uh, we can ignore all of this because this is essentially just outputting information. So it displays on the screen uh, and we have a nice little block of code here that will perform this entire rag process for us. So it is going to create a chat input box for us. Uh, and when the um, chat input essentially go button is hit, what it is going to do, it is going to add the message and the question from the user to the chat history so that we can display it. And then it is going to add a message from the bot. And this is quite simply going to call the vector search function, passing in the prompt to look up the information. It is going to get the response and invoke that chain that we described previously, passing it both the user's question and the relevant context. And then it is going to display the output as markdown and it is going to add that answer to the conversation history. So hopefully that should be quite a simple little application and if we jump into um, the web app here this is what Streamlit looks like um, with pretty much zero web programming at all we were able to add an image, some titles, some sections um, and a nice little text input box there. So we are now able to ask the question finally who is Robert Goodman, uh, hit enter, and it's going to think for a little while, uh, just as it passes the information, it does the lookup, and it calls the GPT API, and hopefully it should return with an answer to who Robert Goodman is. And we can see now that it's actually been able to provide correct, correct information for us uh, about this fictional character. Uh, you're just going to have to take my word for the fact it's correct, because uh, I made it up, but we can ask sort of follow-up questions on this. So we can say, how old is Robert Goodman? If I could type and speak at the same time. Um, and it's going to be able to tell us questions like how old he is, um, what are his beliefs? And we essentially now have a chatbot that if we were to go into ChatGPT, is able to answer questions on information we have that wouldn't otherwise be answerable by these large language models, uh, which gives us the opportunity to use a large number of use cases and leverage the power of all of the documentation that we're sort of storing and create curating to build applications that kind of go above and beyond what you can do with chat gpt without having to go into the realms of fine tuning and anything like that um, and we can also have a little bit of a look at things like prompt engineering because i can see that i've got 12 minutes left um, so we can get it to do silly things as well uh, to show how we can interact uh, you are a helpful assistant designed to answer questions, always speaking in rhyme. Uh, in, I can't spell rhyme. It's gone from my head. Um, always speaking in, um, I've literally forgotten how to spell rhyme. That is what you get. Uh, we'll say riddled instead. So it's always speaking in riddles. I've never forgotten how to spell quite so easily. So what we have done there 
is because we are running our application. We can update the code, uh, we can save it, and then we can run it again. So hopefully now we can say, who is Robert Goodman? And it should give us a riddle to answer the question, or at least something a little bit more mysterious than we had before. Yeah, there we go. Uh, we've now got the same sort of answer, but we have changed the tone that we want. Uh, and we have got our answer in the form of a strange riddle. Um, so I'm going to jump back to the last slide and say thank you very much for your time. Uh, hopefully you have now a better understanding of generative AI, large language models and RAG implementations, all wrapped up in a slightly silly use case asking a question about an imaginary space farmer. Uh, any questions? Yeah, so thank you, Alexander, for a great presentation and demo. So we'll now get into the questions and answers part. Should you wish to ask a question, please feel free to type it in the questions box now. So our first question today is, what measures are in place to, to prevent sensitive information from being leaked or generated by these models? Cool, uh, so that's a fantastic question. Um, in the application that I just demoed, um, there is the kind of Microsoft behind the scenes tool called Content Safety, uh, which is essentially a tool baked into Microsoft OpenAI, which prevents things like um, violence, sexual references, anything like that kind of being mentioned by the responses from the bots. Um, but in terms of kind of extra steps at the moment, absolutely nothing, uh, but that is definitely something that we rectified very easily. Uh, so we could expand on the prompt quite a lot in order to add a lot of sort of cases in there to um, save from handing out sensitive information. Uh, there are also tools out there, things like Nemo guardrails and various different guardrails too, which are a lot more sort of in-depth and robust method that you can use to go, yeah, we want to be providing answers using our internal information, but we want this tool to have specific boundaries uh, around the things that it can talk about and the things that it can't. Um, so the next sort of step to expand this application would to be look at implementing some guardrails uh, and the tool I personally prefer is Nemo guardrails from NVIDIA because uh, they are incredibly robust. You can kind of configure them outside of the Python script in various nice config files, which makes it sort of very easy to import and export them into different projects. Perfect. Um, so just the next question here is, um, I've been using Azure OpenAI Studio for a while. Now looking at Azure AI Studio, it is a bit confusing. Can you please help explain what an AI hub is and what is difference? What difference is with a project? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if I jump back over into AI Studio, um, essentially the way that AI Studio works is it has a hub and project architecture. Um, so they do look very similar now um in that you have a lot of the shared tabs but essentially the hub is just where anything that is shared amongst all projects is stored so these are some things like deployments so some model deployments can be shared across all of the different projects um and things like connections to your different services uh user management content filters a hub is essentially anything that you want all of the different developers using the ai studio to have access to and then a project is essentially just a way of breaking off into an individual space which focuses more on the implementation of a particular idea. Um, so we can see here that this is the hub options menu and it has, you know, it has things like the catalog, the benchmarks, the prompts um, and some of the assistance and playgrounds along with the kind of the compute instances, the connections, the user management and the content filters. And then if we go into my demo project here, you can see that a lot of that stuff is similar, but you get the slightly more sort of specific tools around building your applications. Uh, and also from a sort of technical perspective, uh, when you're looking at your resource group, you can see that there is an individual resource for each of the projects. They connect to their own sort of privately allocated area of the AI Studio blob store and essentially just allow you to keep all of your data for working in particular projects kind of compartmentalized into a single area, essentially just to stop any sort of bloat. You know, if you have 10 developers working on seven different projects all in AI Studio, uh, you can have a project for each of the projects uh, to have some slightly confusing language, which is able to kind of separate everything out. It separates how it's stored in the back end and all of the stuff like that. 
hopefully that answers the question a little bit. Perfect. So, so the next question there is, what advancements in generative AI and RAG do you foresee in the next five to ten years? <laughs> so I think five to ten years is in a field moving as quickly as generative AI uh, is quite hard to predict, but definitely, you know, the sort of next year or two, it looks like the sort of way technology is going is shifting very much towards multi-agent applications. Um, so at the moment, we've got the one I demonstrated, which is a sort of a, a single agent. We have a question, we have an agent that performs a task, which is the model, and then it provides an output. Um, as you get more complex implementations, you are looking towards having lots of different models performing lots of different tasks in a sort of greater service. Um, so Microsoft Autogen is definitely, I think, going to be the next big and upcoming thing for these sorts of applications, which are able to handle a much wider variety of sort of tasks within one application. Uh, I know that at Microsoft Build a few months ago now, they were talking quite a lot about Autogen and they have the Autogen Studio, I think in some form of preview at the moment, certainly coming up to be released in the next year or two. So I'd say that looks to be the direction that things are going currently. Um, I am gonna wuss out slightly and not commit to a five to 10 year question, because honestly, at the rate things are changing, I'm not sure, you know, if I looked at where my kind of work and career was going three years ago, never would have guessed it would have been generative AI, didn't even know it existed. Uh, and now sort of my, my day job and my kind of passion projects are all in generative AI, which, you know, when I had my first job, when I graduated university, just didn't exist. Amazing. So there's the next question there is, would you mind explaining the differences between an agent built with assistance API and an agent built with chat completion API? Um, so chat completions, well, a completions model versus a chat model um, are essentially two slightly different things um, that are quite similar. I think the main sort of thing to note at the moment is that completions models are sort of going out of favor because chat models can do everything that a completions models can, but with the sort of the maintenance of the chat history and that additional sort of context. Um, as for the sort of specific implementations within the AI studio, unfortunately, I'm not too sure. Um, I don't do too much sort of development within the AI studio outside of sort of data storage and indexing. Perfect. So I think that's all the questions. Um, so on behalf of the ESPC community, we'd like to extend a big thank you to you again, Alexander, for taking the time today to carry out this webinar. We really appreciate it. Fantastic. Um, well, thank you for having me on. It's been great fun. Sorry, just stack some that added to the last question is my question is for the difference between assistance API and chat completion API. Ah. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure the answer to that question. Um, I imagine that there is a whole bunch of Microsoft documentation on it, though. Um, so that will probably be able to enlighten you a lot more than I can. Perfect. So I think that's the end of today's webinar. So you can find this webinar and more at sharepointeurope.com forward slash resource center. Thanks again to you all for joining us today, and I hope you join us again soon. Take care.